When people think about the types of education best suited for prisoners, they often think about career and technical education, things like carpentry, plumbing, and electrical. For some, it's a question of what's practical. People coming home from prison need a skill that connects directly to a job. For others, limiting the type of prison education is an extension of the regime of punishment. Why should taxpayers support, say, a college level education when so many people outside prison can't afford or access one? My view is that both of these are short-sighted. Most people have neither the aptitude nor the interest for skilled labor, including prisoners. And the punishment of incarceration is more than sufficient without piling on more limits and denials. If we want rehabilitation and not just punishment, educational opportunity, vocational and academic is needed. The liberal arts inside correctional facilities has a significant role to play in helping incarcerated people reconnect with themselves and with the world around them. Unfortunately, due to the 1994 crime bill, many people behind bars struggle to access this type of education. Private philanthropy has tried to step in and fill part of the gap. One such program is the Bard Prison Initiative at Bard College. Bard operates a fully accredited liberal arts college program inside correctional facilities in New York State, providing both associate and bachelor level education to incarcerated learners. This program was highlighted in a recent four part documentary, College Behind Bars, which is available through Netflix for screening. It is a remarkably moving story of how education doesn't just change lives, but rehumanizes prisoners and restores their dignity. My guest today on Hardly Working is Max Kenner, the founder and executive director of the Bard Prison Initiative, himself a graduate of Bard College. In today's conversation, we discuss the role of education and the rehabilitative process, the importance of increasing access to the great books for everyone in our society, and how the liberal arts is preparing prisoners for the modern workforce. Max Kenner, thank you for joining us on Hardly Working. Rand, it's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. I can't tell you how much I've been looking forward to this. I have my own interest in kind of prison education issues that I've had for a long time. Uh, but then I saw the um, PBS four-part series on the Bard Prison Initiative, and um, I instantly knew that I needed to have um, somebody from Bard. Glad we could get you, but come on and talk about this. Um, you yourself have a fascinating background. I wonder if you could just kind of talk us through your own history, how you got engaged in this work, um, and how it connects to who you are as a person. Sure. Um, I, uh, in general, I try to avoid the uh, politics of biography, etc. But um, for me, I don't have much of a work history. I think, as you know, I was an undergraduate at Bard College in the late 1990s um, and really was struck by a few things. Um, first and foremost, the the existence, the power, uh, the prevalence of the system that we now call mass incarceration. The term didn't exist at the time, uh, but the radical overinvestment that we'd made as a society in punishment and punishment, of course, unfortunately, of course, uh, of people from very specific communities, right? African-American young men in particular, above all. Uh, but I was also struck as an undergraduate by our divestment in other institutions, meaning colleges, particularly liberal arts colleges, you know, while I was a student at one. Um, so I did a little research, started digging around. I was a person who was from New York City, who left the city to go to the Hudson Valley to spend my uh, four years of my life as a, rel as a young adult, you know, uh, at an institution that was designed to open up possibility for me uh, for my future, for my future career, for my imagination, uh, and knew that many, many young adults, young men my precise age were leaving New York City to come to the Hudson Valley, to go to institutions that cost as much as a liberal arts college financially, more to the taxpayer, in fact, to do the opposite, to close off their future 
career, mobility, freedom, et cetera. Uh, and so we brought the idea. I, I had the idea, did a little research about what a college might do in response to this phenomenon of uh, overinvestment and punishment, incarceration uh, of young people, particularly young people of color, particularly African Americans. Uh, and it, it turned out there was something a college could do that would have profound national impact and also be right at the core of its own mission. And that was simply to offer what it does for anyone else uh, to incarcerated people in prisons. And we started with uh, no funding and really no likelihood of, no likelihood of success. But um, here we are 20 years later. So what did you study at Bard? I studied history uh, and unrelated to um, to these questions mostly, mostly early and 19th century American history. Mm, very interesting. Um, and w looking back on your own life, because you know, you're talking about uh, all of these young, mainly minority males who are in prison, they've all got a life history and things that have that happened to them. But what about you? What was your, when you look back at your life, who are the big influences on you? in terms of your choices of education and vocation? There's no question, Brent, there are any number of teachers uh, who I could talk about who invested a lot in me, and I've been very lucky to go to terrific schools uh, my entire life. Um, I have not been a terrific student my entire life, though I worked hard uh, when I was an undergraduate, and that paid off very handsomely for me in that I have such a fulfilling career now. Uh, but I'd like to refer specifically, um, not just to one of my parents, to my father, but one anecdote and things that we have in common that I think is relevant to American education at every level. Uh, so my father uh, was a person who um, grew up in New York City and his parents moved to the suburbs uh, for high school, he went to one of the best most distinguished public high schools in the United States in the 1950s in the Maranek, uh, in the suburbs outside of New York City. Uh, went to the University of California at Berkeley before it became kind of Berkeley of the 60s. Uh, you know, Berkeley in the late 1950s. Uh, and while he was in high school, he was wildly fulfilled by education. Completely devoted, mostly uh, to history, but really to the full breadth of his education. Uh, but when he arrived at Berkeley, the, it was a very large place. It was impersonal, uh, whatever was going on in his own life. Uh, and he dropped out. He failed. He, you know, he, he didn't fail, but he, he dropped out uh, and went to work uh, back at home in New York. Um, and eventually went on to co finish a BA uh, at Columbia in general studies uh, and then a PhD in American history much, much later in life uh, after, uh, after retiring from business. And the reason I say that is because for me, uh, it was the opposite experience in my education. I was a, um, again, I went to very good schools, was very lucky. Uh, my parents uh, you know, sent me to, to elite schools my whole life, uh, but I barely went to high school and never opened my backpack you know, for, for months or years at a time and you know, was extremely lucky to get into a college like Bard. Uh, and never interested, was never interested, never really tried in school prior to college. And for me, when I finally, I took some time off, when I finally arrived at an undergraduate liberal arts college, I never experienced something so exciting, so fulfilling, and so liberating as full engagement in the liberal arts and the college curriculum. And the reason why that is interesting to me, that juxtaposition, and it relates to our work at the Bard Prison Initiative, is because we need to understand as educators that people come to this stuff at different moments in their life. And no one is successful at this stuff if it's forced upon them. But if they're motivated and they're excited and fulfilled by academic work, they can achieve all kinds of things. But we, those of us who design educational institution, institutions need to provide pathways for people to engage with this kind of breadth of study at all different moments in their lives. Lots of young people are under, you know, not challenged in elementary and high school and need to be challenged much more. And others of us aren't interested in school early in life and need access 
and will benefit from access to adult education uh, much later on. So that is a, an incredible segue uh, to, the, to our conversation, um, because there's more than one kind of prison that people can put themselves in, right? Sure. Um, you can be uh, incarcerated. You can also have, you know, reflecting on St. John's College motto um, down in Annapolis, talking about, you know, freeing the mind. Um, uh, and, and I really believe that that's what liberal arts education actually does, is that it creates people with minds that are strong enough to be free. Um, uh, and so I, it, it's a very, very good, um, God, what a great story. Thank you so much for, uh, for sharing it. Um, so you're the founder and the executive director of BPI. Um, at, for those who aren't familiar, as familiar with it as, as I am, just give us the overview. What is the Bard Prison Initiative? And tell us, um, well, as much as you can about its history and, uh, and people it serves. Sure. So the Bard Prison Initiative at its core does something very simple. We provide a full liberal arts college education to undergraduate students. What's unusual about the work we do is we enroll students in state prisons, full-time in academic programs that uh, culminate in associate and bachelor's degrees from Bard College. The academic curriculum and expectations of the program we provide are identical to what happens on campus. And we provide a full breadth of a liberal arts education. We won't go to a prison and presume become, because someone is incarcerated or has a certain background or has some perceived uh, limitations imposed on them by others that they are either interested in certain sections of a liberal arts curriculum or only capable of other portions of our undergraduate experience. We go with as few expectations as possible and provide precisely the same kind of education, Brent, that I think you or I would hope for, for our own children when we send them off to university. And so I noticed in the, in the documentary that um, you have both uh, AA level education as well as BA. How does that, how, how do you make decisions about who goes where, you know, um, how, do, how do people find those pathways? Sure, so obviously the AA comes first, right? And AA is a two year degree conventionally in the United States. Uh, it's a degree provided by or conferred by community colleges. But for us in the prisons, the AA has a number of important uses. First of all, just after a couple of years of study, it's a signpost of a certain amount of success. Also, we don't have every student who enrolls with us while they're in prison for a large number of years. So it enables someone to get a degree uh, if they don't have time to go on to, to complete the bachelor's degree. But in general, the associate degree is an associate's degree in liberal studies. It's broad. Uh, it's meant to introduce students to the widest variety of academic subjects. And it focuses on some very core skills in mathematics, but prim primarily in writing, reading, and thinking. At the BA level, students zero in much more specifically in their field of major and go on to write what we call senior projects, generally you know, what you think of as undergraduate senior theses, research papers of 80 to 100, 120 pages in length. So this is an academic program that happens in prison, but is on par with the level of work that happens at any learning college in the United States. And so um, do you require everybody who does go on, you have to do the AA and then you go into the BA if you're, if you're going to be in prison long right. enough, you, you right. don't just jump to a BA per That's term. right. Okay. That's right. It's a, it's a, se it's a, it's a separate process. It's a, it's a separate program. It only happens at certain prisons Though we're able to collaborate with the Department of Corrections to move people to those places uh, when, um, when that time is right. Uh, so it's a complicated process, right? We've kind of built a unusually structured uh, college, but also the academic program around some of the specificities of the prison, but none of the content. The content is the same as what happens on Bard's campus or anywhere else. 
And so what's the application process for people who want to become involved in the program? Sure. So this is something we put a lot of thought into. Uh, first of all, it is a subjective process, right? We uh, have no pretense of making objective evaluations about individual applicants. That is to say, there are no number two pencils, no bubble tests, no multiple choice, et cetera. We announce that we are doing admission to the college, uh, typically in the summertime, but throughout the prison, uh, people are invited to apply. The prison generally insists that to apply, a person must have a high school diploma or a GED, though it's not something that we especially uh, pay attention to. We're very much not interested in people's academic backgrounds. Uh, to the contrary, we assume that we are looking for terrific people, people who are potentially terrific students who have bad experiences with their all kinds of institutions in their past. And so uh, lack of success in the past is not at all an indicator of what should come in the future. So we sit everybody down who's applied, we provide a uh, a handful of readings, typically very short readings, maybe opinion pieces, selections from a poem or a history book or what have you, and invite applicants to respond to those in any way they desire. Um, and we bring those back. A committee of us reads every one of them closely. Uh, then we invite between a third and a half of those applicants for an interview, uh, and we have a conversation. And students, or applicants rather, have an enormous variety of things that might qualify them for the college. It might be some actual academic preparedness, though that's not typical. It might be uh, somebody in their life is just pushing them to do this in a way that makes them feel like they have to do it. Uh, there are students who are recognized so palpably that so much is at stake for them in this process that any failures they've experienced in the past or any lack of training they have bringing to the process, you can recognize that they can overcome that, right? So as we talked about earlier, you know, what a student sees as being at stake for themselves is more important than what zip code they're from, what university their parents went to, et cetera. And we can achieve remarkable things uh, if we acknowledge that. Okay, so they get in and they are, they're in an AA program. They're getting the, um, the you know, sort of that broad, ex that initial broad experience um, in kind of liberal arts education. You know, one of the things that I stumble on a lot in this topic area is a kind of a, a focus uh, within, within both prisons and in the policy world of types of education that are more trade oriented, you know, to become a plumber, become an electrician, become a woodworker, you know, while you're in prison, that this is seen as kind of the norm, you know, this is what people in prison should, should do because they need a skill that, so that when they get out, they've got, you know, better work opportunities. Um, what do you, what do you make of that? What, what is that about? And what, uh, from your perspective, um, uh, it, are there limitations to it, um, uh, that kind of thinking about prison education? I don't believe that the limitations of that kind of thinking when it comes to prison education are all that different from the limitations of that kind of thinking when we're thinking about the general public. People in prison are subject to the sort of random uh, and punitive parts of people's imaginations all the time. So it becomes a kind of caricature in the prison context. But in general, in the United States, we've spent over a few centuries uh, building a kind of undergraduate, undergraduate education that is distinguished in the history of the world and prepares people for a kind of engagement with their communities and with the economy and with their interior selves in a way that very few other kinds of educations do. 
and over the last 40 or 50 years, we've abandoned those, those processes. And what's ironic is that as we've abandoned them, other parts of the world have come to recognize that in fact, and this is what's so profound and, and backward destructive about the way we do education now in the United States, that in fact, the best training for work in the 21st century is not preparation to you know, repair a lawnmower or to build a house, though there's a place for each of those things. It's a liberal arts education because of the nature of how the economy has transformed over the course of the last 20 years, a diversity of expertise and a capacity to improvise are both more important than specific skills relating to machinery or uh, 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 you know, certain circumstances that are changing so fast, they won't be there by the time a person's education is complete. So uh, you must have thought about this question a lot um, because I, I completely agree with what you just said. I think this is the big, the big lie <laughs> of uh, workforce preparation uh, in the United States, which is focusing on kind of narrow skills when what we really need are broad, flexible um, skills that allow us to adapt um, quickly. Where do you think this change came from in American education? I mean, given that we did invest for centuries in building up a model mm -hmm. that the rest of the world is imitating, and now we're kind of rejecting it, where do you think that change came from? Well, sometime after the, the various revolutions, you know, of the 1960s, particularly the civil rights revolution of the 1960s, I think we developed a profound cynicism in American life uh, about democracy itself, uh, certainly about um, integration after the relative successes and failures of, of the civil rights movement, um, but also about young people in general, right? So let's talk backing away from the liberal arts context for a second, let's talk about the history of my particular field, college and prison, right? We, uh, we at BPI get a lot of accolades for doing something sort of new or innovative that actually is fairly embarrassing and um, incorrect because in many ways, there's nothing innovative about what we do. There was college and prison in virtually every state and federal prison in the United States for a generation across the board. Uh, college and prison from 1970s to the mid 1990s did more to reduce recidivism, reduce violence, increase the likelihood of a, of a person in prison having a healthy relationship with their family, increase post-incarceration uh, incomes, you know, all the things you would think a prisoner would aim to do. Uh, and that was eviscerated with the Clinton crime bill in 1995. We went from college being virtually everywhere to virtually nowhere, right? Um, and why do I bring that up? Because in the late 1980s, early 1990s, there was a movement afoot to destroy education in the prisons, despite all of its proven efficacy. And, you know, there's all kinds of horrible quotes that we could cite from elected officials, Republicans and Democrats, overwhelmingly really bigoted and hateful uh, and, and, and ignorant, um, North, South, you know, politicians all over the landscape, focusing on how outrageous it was that these people were receiving a college education. But was, what was ironic about that wasn't the visceral racism, which existed there, it was that those same elected officials to a woman or to a man were at the same time destroying state investment in higher education across the board for everyone else, right? So college and prison was used politically as a lightning rod to make people angry that certain kinds of people that were easy to dislike we're getting an education. But at the same time, we were divesting in higher education. In the late 1980s in, in, here in New York State, we were spending triple on higher education than we were on our prison systems. 
And by the late 1990s, we were spending $800 million more a year on our prison system than our state university system, right? So it goes to show not just the relative success and failures, again, of the civil rights movement and how that impacted all our politics uh, in the United States, but also an ongoing cynicism and fear about, of young people in general across the board. So that's really interesting. And I hadn't ever connected sort of the, I mean, I hear this all the time when I'm talking to both students and to adults, uh, parents, um, you know, that there's a real um, skepticism, cynicism probably um, is not too strong a word for uh, anything other than non-technical or anything other than kind of technical education, even for undergraduates, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I can't, I, I would really prefer to study philosophy, but my parents won't pay for it. So I'm going to study computer science. Um, not that there's anything wrong with studying computer science. In fact, I think there's a great synergy between fields like philosophy and computer science, if it's understood properly. Um, uh, but that's a very interesting point that you're making about how the attack was on higher education generally, and prisons swept up into that um, into that phenomenon, and I and it, and it still it persists today because I'm, I'm having conversations with people on Capitol Hill about you know work, you know, uh, and workforce development and training, and the there is an instantaneous knee jerk reaction against uh, undergraduate education for everyone not just for people in prison, but for everyone. It's, it's seen as a waste of time. Um, and I hadn't, uh, until now, until what you just said, kind of put all of that, all of that together as being a kind of a broad general assault on it. Um, we talk a lot when we first enroll students about why we provide the kind of education that we do, especially in the places where we do do it. Uh, and we always say, that there are two essential components, right? One is about the student themselves, that we genuinely believe that a broad education will make you, Brent, a better carpenter if you know history. You'll be a more original carpenter if you know history. Or if you go on to be a radio host, you'll be more creative and more interesting if you know something about the arts or certainly if you're a mathematician, understanding the history of art will help you in your work and career, et cetera, et cetera, right? In all the careers that we think of as vocational, you'll be better at them if you are trained with a liberal arts education, but you'll also be better if you're unemployed, if you're a parent, if you have a godson or daughter, if you have this kind of education and you can share with them the wealth of the world. So that's about how it affects the students. But also we say, we do this because we're selfish, because we live in a democracy and we know that democracy can't function without a broadly informed citizenry. And if we don't provide this kind of education to the maximal amount of people, we'll fail in our civic existence. Yeah, uh, so education, uh, isn't just about earning a living. It's about figuring out how to live, period, uh, and how to be at, happy is the wrong word, but you know, a, living a fulfilled life um, hinges on these on this broad knowledge of the world and not just what we do um, to support ourselves economically. So I want to switch back now to the specific experiences of the men and women that you're working with um, through the Bard Prison Initiative. And I, wanted, I want you to talk to us a little bit about what you and the faculty have noticed about how the curriculum affects that progress toward uh, happiness and sort of a, an 18th century understanding of happiness, mm -hmm. you know, of, of contentment. How does, how does that engagement for people who are behind bars and those ideas in these big picture 
texts and investigations? How does that affect their um, that that sense of progressing toward a happier state, but also the kind of psychological and emotional shift that's needed to help people move away from criminal activity. Now, it may be that, in fact, you're pulling people in who've already made a decision that they want something different. But it may also be the case that you've got people who haven't made that decision or who are, who are sort of on the, on the bubble as to whether they're going to go back to what they were doing before they were arrested. So how does this, how does this affect kind of um, people when we, when we think about the topic of desistance and kind of that, those psycho-emotional triggers that people need to find in order to change their lives? Sure. So we are desistance skeptics, um, but only kind of, and I'll explain to you what I mean. So the first major transformation happens not in relation to any text, but on the very first day in the very first hour of college life. And that's because we present ourselves as an institution that makes no judgment about a person's past, but makes a commitment to their future and has a relationship with them entirely independent of the entire apparatus of carrots, carrots and sticks and punishment uh, and judgment that surrounds them and has in many cases surrounded them for many years, right? When you step in that classroom and that door closes, you are at Bard College, full stop. That is liberating and transformational in its own right. And you, you, know, you get a certain degree of where we have to go just doing that irrespective of what curriculum we offer after that. Okay, and that's very hard, right? And that's why public policy changes alone won't get us to where we need to go in college and prison because you need to have college and program, college programs that have the room uh, to have that kind of independence and colleges that have the will to have that kind of independence uh, within this context, right? Um, there's no shortage of uh, bigotry of expectations or other things among our leaders in higher education, right? So um, uh, we have to do that. Secondly, when we talk about the curriculum itself, you know, we don't observe that one field of study or another does more to reduce crime or uh, have some kind of measurable outcome. If anything, we believe something counterintuitive, which is the less we make students feel like they are studying in a petri dish and the less we measure their results the more the outcomes will be the kinds of things that the you know the gates foundation or the people in the federal government would want to see even though sometimes i think we obscure them uh, uh, in pursuit of that sense in a student's imagination that what we are doing with them is primarily for them and their own sense of self the other thing I'd say about a liberal arts education uh, that we don't often talk about, and that's so important, uh, is that what we do, aside from making people feel fulfilled by the ideas and dialogues and stories and experiences that they encounter in a liberal education, you also convey to someone that all of this stuff, the stuff in the museum, the stuff at the opera, the stuff in the books, the stuff that they're talking about in city hall or in the state hall, all of that belongs to you as much as it belongs to anyone else. And that's a kind of freedom, but also responsibility of ownership uh, that leads to desistance perhaps, but I think more and better outcomes than have to do with crime or not crime. Fascinating. Um, you know, we, we uh, in the public policy world are fixated on this desistance question because it has been a virtually impossible nut to crack. Uh, it either happens or it doesn't happen, uh, but it doesn't seem to yield very much to any particular policy uh, or program or uh, approach. Um, 
So that that's the source of that question. I, I believe that you're getting those, I suspect, I should say, that you're getting those outcomes. But again, I think it's a good point that you get those outcomes not by aiming at them, but at, by aiming at something else. Um, and uh, I think that's really an important it's an important point. I'm curious, and maybe this is true for all undergrads at Bard, but I'm curious as to whether there are any particular kinds uh, or classes, texts, uh, other things that uh, students, um, the the students who are in the Bard Prison Initiative, react to the most strongly. Um, that seem to have uh, uh, a a so anything that stands out in terms of uh, you know a particular impact. Does that do you have anything in mind? Is it different for everybody? Uh, we again we resist the question. We resist the question. I, I no que- and if, There's no doubt there are texts that students respond to more than others. But for us, particularly because our students overwhelming, overwhelmingly have had such bad experience with institutions and schools in their past, the most important thing is suggesting that this is an education that is theirs to create and that is built for them. And so then whether it's, uh, you know, reading the history of sociology or African-American literature or French poetry or uh, the history of African art or what have you uh, becomes less relevant, right? There are things we learn in school that are, that are data, that are trivia. There are little pieces of information that should amount to something meaningful. But then there are things that we learn in school that are about how we pursue a fulfilling life and how when we're curious about something, we find out some of the truth about it. And that's more important, I think, than those data points or pieces of trivia. Yeah, I, and I don't mean to focus uh, especially, on this. Especially, Brent, yeah. at the undergraduate level. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess my thought on this is when I look back at my own undergraduate education, I can really point to particular classes professors, uh, topics that really grabbed me Mm -hmm. and sort of propelled me um, into the rest of my life. Um, I studied a lot of Eastern European and Russian history, but the class that I remember the most, two classes I remember the most were world literature and the history of the American city. Um, which were fantastic classes. Um, and I think that they were important because they, they sort of grabbed me, shook me up a little bit, made me think about a bigger world that drew me into other things. And that's really what I'm kind of driving at. Everybody has that experience. And I'm just curious, is, are there any commonalities? Or maybe there's a story of particular students who you know, just really had uh, that you could, you know, sort of see that that happening for them as they engage in the classes. Look, we 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 offer students a curriculum that focuses a certain amount of attention on things that might be uh, predictable history of the city, uh, you know, history of race in the United States, um, history of education, the failure of schools in the United States. Um, We do that. Uh, And, you you know, the vast majority of our students go on, you know, terrifically well. They've gone on to complete graduate degrees at places like Columbia, Yale, NYU, Cornell, et cetera. They work in business, they work in government. But the vast majority of students go back to the communities that they came from to provide a kind of service that is only possible because of their very unusual combination of life experience, Mm -hmm. formal education, and professional expertise, Mm. right? And so one might be inspired by that, um, uh, you know, 
epidemiology class that they took, uh, but it was also their excitement studying math that got them into graduate school. And that's why that person is now a top researcher at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, right? Uh, but there's also a student who might come to the school thinking all she wants is the training for work, a career. What does this all have to do with me? Mm. But she reads a famous distinguished ethnography of the life of the Eskimo. And it transforms her life in a way where now she has become the most prominent um, organizer in public housing in New York City, right? So it's unpredictable, uh, but it's always, um, it's always most successful when we focus on the individual student. Very good. Uh, let's see. What else do we need to talk about here? Um, uh, I'd love to talk about yeah. assistance just a bit more. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Because, you know, uh, one thing, you know, uh, the question of recidivism, right? Uh, recidivism, in our view, is not a, a matter of individual decision making. Recidivism is about public policy. The vast majority of people who return to prison return because of technical violations of parole, right? So if we want fewer in people, people in prison, let's have fewer people in prison. If we want less violence in society, well, that's a different question, uh, but it's not a question of whether we should have more or less people in prison. Yes, desistance like what we were talking about earlier in terms of education, we tend to break everything down into very narrow components and, and ask ourselves, which of these dials can we adjust in order to get a better outcome? And that, that's, the wrong, that's the wrong question to be asking, um, which is why I'm so intrigued by uh, programs like BPI. I think that's exactly right. I think the lower a person falls on the ladder of social hierarchy, the more atomized those components that you're mm. describing become mm -hmm. and the worse we treat people. And mm -hmm. so what we try to build as a new kind of college in the 21st century, a college that doesn't charge tuition, um, is how do we engage students in the most holistic way? We live in a social uh, world now where you know, much fewer people have deep and profound relationships with their church, mosque, or synagogue. They don't have those kinds of social uh, bonds that, you know, labor unions used to create for people. People are more isolated than they ever were. And if we're going to provide a kind of education that really has a profound impact on people's life, we can talk about the curriculum, but we also have to engage people as if they're complete human beings. And that does not need to end at graduation, mm -hmm. right? There mm -hmm. are ways we should engage alumni and invest in their future, which we do, that extend long past their course of study. And their relationship to us is an inspiration for current students, as well as for us. And our engagement with them, I hope, is, uh, is helpful in their further success. So I'd like you to go a little bit further with that because um, it's an angle I hadn't thought of. What happens after people graduate and then leave prison and how does BPI remain in touch with its alumni and what kind of engagement uh, do you try to uh, try to foster? Sure. So the first thing is, again, overcoming this question of desistance or recidivism and not thinking about opportunities for failure but instead thinking about opportunities for success, thinking about a better future rather than a, a sort of aggrieved past, right? That is the first thing we do. Secondly, uh, one of the many problems with recidivism is it suggests that if a person comes home from prison and you, you know, hand them a broom or a mop and a minimum wage job and they don't go, go back to prison, we can declare success. Now, there's nothing wrong with those professions, but many of our students have ambitions that are great and are trained for all kinds of other different uh, experiences or careers. So what we do is less provide specific services 
than broker relationships. First, in that acute, really challenging period of reentry after release, housing, healthcare, sort of short-term employment, that, that, that stuff to prevent crisis. But over the period of years and now decades, we help create pathways to long-term careers and particularly careers of civic meaning and influence. So we have a track training young people to go into different forms of education. We have a track training people for careers in public health. It's been enormously successful. We have a partnership uh, with the Ford Foundation training people for leadership roles in the future of philanthropy. That's terrific. Um, so uh, one issue that I meant to bring up uh, earlier is about how um, the people who administer prisons respond um, to the program. Because uh, I've heard in a number of other contexts that uh, one of the barriers that undergraduate education in prison faces is actually um, the people who work in the prisons. Um, and how have you navigated that? Um, there can be jealousy, there can be resentment um, uh, toward uh, BA level education for uh, people working in the prisons who haven't had that opportunity. How does that work? There absolutely can be. But again, we shouldn't generalize. Right. Yeah. So we talked earlier about the evisceration of college and prison with the Clinton crime bill uh, 20 plus years ago. When that bill was coming before Congress, the lobby that came to Capitol Hill most vociferously opposing the elimination of college and prison were people who ran prisons themselves. OK, so none of our work would be possible if it wasn't for the cooperation of the people who ran the prisons. So, you know, we should never minimize the challenge or the violence of what life is like inside of our prisons in the United States. But let's also not generalize about the people who work within them. And in fact, what we find, generally speaking, is that support among prison administrations for college and prison reflects a community's or a state's belief in higher education itself. There's some, you know, there's some glaring exceptions to that rule, but, um, but in general, that's how I would describe it. And there's always a variety within a prison. So people are, you're telling me that people are people and places are places and, uh, and that includes prisons. Uh, they'll reflect, they reflect because they are part of the society around them. Well, what I'm saying is that when I got into this field of work when I was 21 or 22 years old, I was assured by people that knew a whole lot more than I did that this was impossible. Mm. And there were a few ways why it was impossible, but the first and most prevalent and common was because the people who ran the prisons would never ever let it happen. Mm. And whether it was my own naivete or stupidity or lack of personal history. So people who worked in those prisons, you know, made no assumptions about me, whatever that was, we're still here. And we're here because we were willing to assume the best rather than the worst of folks. Awesome, thank you. Um, last question, uh, your program and COVID, uh, how is that affecting um, what you're what you're trying to do? It's um it's a hard question, Brent. We are. I've gone longer uh, without being in a prison um, than I ever have in my adult life. Uh, we have less contact. We have no physical direct contact with our student bodies. We move to do an enormous amount uh, via the mail by the phone, the prisons have started to allow a little bit more technology, just a teeny bit, we shouldn't exaggerate. So we're moving to some conversations, not on Zoom, but uh, kinds of video conferencing. But I don't want to focus on what we are doing now. I wanna focus on how we return to what we had and make that more common. Because when we think about COVID 
in the context of higher education, you know, not just the financial crisis, it's, it's brought on colleges uh, all across the world. But also crises like COVID tend to accelerate systemic processes that were already happening. And in higher education, you know, very few of those processes are good news. And one of them is, is an acceleration towards the kind of learning that happens over a computer, that happens with not personal relationships. And our role at BPI is to be the exception to the rule in the future United States, where only the luckiest and richest few benefit from a kind of education that happens in person in the way that we've done it uh, really for centuries in the civilization. Max Kenner, thank you so much um, for your time today. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for the work that you're doing. Uh, I think it's extremely important. And um, we look forward to hearing more about it as your program continues and thrives and grows. So again, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Brent, and thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Hardly Working. I'm your host, Brent Orell, and I hope you tune in next time to learn more about the state of workforce development in America. Be sure to like and subscribe to our podcast. Let us know at vocation at AEI.org if there are any topics you'd like us to cover. As always, we hope you find the job that fits so well, it feels like you're hardly working. Hardly working.